All right, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Daniel Hansalek, and this is forty uh, fifth uh, talk of the scheduling seminar. First of all, let me ask uh, Mike Pinedo to introduce the speaker. Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce Tammy Tamir. Uh, Tammy got her PhD uh, in two thousand one at the Technion with Dash Shaknai and they have been working together over those the last two decades and produced an um, impressive number of papers um, mainly scheduling applications in computer science tammy has been most of the time at reichman university in herzliya uh, she has been even there at a sort of moment the dean of the computer science school uh, she has also visited many places in the world uh, everywhere. So she has been at the University of Washington in Seattle. She has also been several summers at uh, uh, at Peking University in Beijing. Uh, she can tell you also about the differences between the, the computer science students in, in mainland China and the computer science students in Israel. It's uh, There seems to be a difference. Um, but okay, she is going to talk today about scheduling with machine-dependent priority lists. Okay, Tommy, you're very, you're, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Inviting me, and indeed, I'm going to talk on scheduling with machine-dependent priority lists. It's a joint work uh, with uh, uh, Vipin and Mark. We have the honor to have them here, and you can see us here working on scheduling with machine-dependent priority list. Um, it's a game. Let's start with the fact that most of the time I'm going to talk about the game. So let's uh, let's talk about the differences between traditional scheduling algorithms and the game. In traditional scheduling algorithms, we have some centralized authority that is sometimes referred to as the scheduler that determines the outcome. And all the user obeys this uh, authority. So this, this centralized authority has some global objective like minimizing the max span or minimizing the total flow times. Um, it assigns the jobs to the machine and determines the outcome. On the other hand, we have job scheduling games. On the other extreme in job scheduling games, the jobs are controlled by selfish uh, agents. Every job is, uh, is a player. Every job only interest on its own utilization. There is no centralized authority. So the main question that we ask is how bad can the outcome be of such a situation when the outcome is uh, not, when the when the jobs are not controlled by uh, by a centralized authority and everyone does their best to itself. One specific class of job scheduling games that we are going to discuss today is denoted coordinated mechanism. It was suggested already almost 20 years ago. So in coordinated mechanism, machines have a local scheduling policy. The jobs know this policy and every job selects its machine according to the policy. For example, assume that all the machines schedule the jobs in LPT order. So longest jobs are first. This is, for example, a possible LPT order. And let's say that jobs whose processing time is five would like to join this schedule. So as a selfish agent, the jobs asks which machine should I join to minimize my completion time. And the jobs are aware of the fact that the machine's local policy is LPT. So this job can consider what would happen if I join the second machine, if I would join the second machine that applies LPT policy, then my completion time would be here, for example, 19. And if I would jo join this, the first machine, my completion time would be 13. So I should better join the first machine. This process that I described now is denoted calculating the best response of the job. So given the decisions of the other player, every job can calculate its best response and it clearly depends on the local policy of the machine. If the machine, for example, apply SPT policy where the jobs are sorted from shortest to longest, then the same job when joining the uh, schedule would have made have a different outcome. So if SPT policy is applied 
then by joining M2, my completion time would be seven, by joining M1, my completion time would be 12, and so on. So it depends. This coordinated mechanism heavily, the outcome heavily depends on the local policies of the machines. Once the, once the job joins the schedule, then other job may have beneficial migration. So let's say that job five is indeed here. Now let's consider the second job of length seven in the resulting schedule. This job can now migrate to the first machine knowing that it applies SPT. The jobs of length seven would be assigned here. So it would reduce its completion time. Now other job may have a beneficial migration. This process is called best response dynamics. Dynamics means that the jobs play, each of them may perform a local step of changing its strategy. So best response dynamics, in short BRD, it's a local search method where players proceed in turns, each performing a selfish improving step. Uh, one of the questions that we always ask is whether BRD converge to a pure Nash equilibrium. What is a pure Nash equilibrium? It's a profile in which no player has an improving step. We can ask them one after the other, do you want to migrate? Do you want to migrate? Do you have a beneficial migration? None of them have a, has a beneficial migration. This is what we call a pure Nash equilibrium. That was a general introduction to coordinated mechanism. What is our work? So in our work, we study such coordinated mechanisms in which different machines may have different local policies. So every machine has its own local policy. And for this associated game, we analyze the existence and the calculation of Nash equilibrium, the convergence of best response dynamics and the equilibrium inefficiency. And I will define it more formally later, what are exactly these terms and how do we measure the equilibrium inefficiency. Not less important, and this is going to be the second part of my talk, uh, we studied the centralized version. So, okay, every machine has its own local policy on how it order the machines that are assigned to it. How can we find a schedule that, for example, minimize the total completion time, the lateness, the centralized version, not the game. But let's start with the game. This is the setting. We have a set J of N jobs. Every job is associated with processing time, PJ. And we have a set M of M parallel machines. Every machine, the machines are not necessarily identical. Machine I has speed SI. And this is the new thing. Machines have priority list. Pi I, this is the priority list of machine I. What is a priority list? It's just a permutation. So it assign every job an index, a rank, defining a scheduling policy. So here is a machine, a possible priority list is just a permutation and order of the job. It means that this is the relative order between the jobs if they are assigned to this machine. For example, let's say that these are our jobs and these are the processing times. Let's say that we have two machines. One of them is speed one. One of them has speed one half. So machine one is the fast machine. Machine two is the slow machine. Every machine has its own priority list. If the jobs decide, E, D, B decides to go to the first machine and A and C decides to go to the second machine, this is the result in schedule. Remember the second machine is slow. So processing A on M2 takes four, two times two and so on. This is the schedule on every machine. The relative is determined by the priority list of the machine. And this profile, this is, this is what we call the profile of a game. The profile of a game is given by a schedule for every job, tell me, to which machine do you go? Once we know what the set of jobs that are going to a machine, they are ordered according to the priority list. Given a profile, CJ, a profile sigma, CJ sigma is the completion time of job J in profile sigma. In this schedule, for example, the completion time of job D is three. So this is the vector of completion time. 
if there are any questions, I will be happy to ask. So let's proceed. And now we refer to the game. This is a possible schedule. We can ask whether anyone has a beneficial migration. Is there a job that would benefit from changing from its machine to the second machine? Here, for example, job C has a beneficial migration. Currently, its completion time is eight. By migrating to machine one, looking at the priority list of machine one, we see that job C would be assigned before job B, reducing its completion time from eight to five. So this is an example of a beneficial migration of a move in our game. Some definitions. So a profile is a pure Nash equilibrium. We already said it. If no job can reduce its completion time by changing its strategy by migrating to a different machine. What is a social optimum? The social optimum in short SO of a game is a profile that attains some optimality criteria. When we say social optimum, we should say with respect to what? We can talk about the social optimum with respect to the total flow time. We can talk about the social optimum with respect to the mate span. The social optimum is actually the solution to the non-game version, the solution to the centralized problem. Uh, we can uh, denote it using the regular notation. When we put pi here, it means that we have priority list. So the social optimum is just the, so the, the optimal solution for the centralized problem, either with identical machine P, pi, C max, the max span, or the total completion time. Interesting question that we would like to answer. Uh, first question is about calculating a Nash equilibrium. We are given a game, find a Nash equilibrium. Once we know, once we characterize the Nash equilibrium schedule, what is the equilibrium inefficiency? The equilibrium inefficiency actually measures what's the cost of letting the players determine the outcome. What's the cost of not having such a centralized authority? It's called the price of anarchy. It's exactly the name. How much do we pay for not having a centralized authority? The price of anarchy measures what's the cost of the worst Nash equilibrium we may end up with, divided by the social optimum. It's always a number which is at least one. Okay, and the price of stability measures the ratio between the best Nash equilibrium and the social optimum. Another question that we would like to understand is what happens when we apply best response dynamics? We just let the players play. Everyone that wants to migrate will get an opportunity to migrate. Will such a dynamic converge to a Nash equilibrium? And what would be its quality? This is already the price of anarchy and the price of stability. So let's start just back to our example. In this instance that we, in this profile, you can see that the max span is eight. We already mentioned that it's not an Nash equilibrium. On the other hand, it's a social optimum. So if all the user would obey the, the, the some authority and the authority will decide that this is the schedule, this is the best we can do for the centralized problem. The social optimum, the max span is always at least eight. On the other hand, we already saw that this is a possible Nash equilibrium. So just to understand again the, the definition, from this example, we can say that the price of anarchy is at least nine over eight. Maybe it's higher because maybe there are even worse Nash equilibrium. I didn't say that, but at least we can say that the price of anarchy is at least nine over eight. Um, okay some related work. So there is plenty of work on scheduling game in general, coordinated the mechanism or other models of job scheduling games. Uh, I only mentioned here the, 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 the basic ones. There are some related work on priority based games but of routing, not of scheduling, and some games on the centralized problem when we control the jobs. Uh, so none of them actually consider our game, but there, there is a lot of overlap for, for the centralized problem or for very limited coordinated mechanisms. So assuming they all apply 
the same global priority list, these are known results, but none of these were considered machine dependent priority lists. Okay, let's start with the problem of calculating Ganache equilibrium. So our input is a game. A game is given by the set of jobs, the, the set of machines, their speeds, and the priority list. We would like to calculate a Nash equilibrium profile. But actually, there is a preliminary question uh, whether a Nash equilibrium exists at all. Okay, we cannot calculate a Nash equilibrium if we don't know whether a Nash equilibrium exists. And I will show you that. Indeed, there are games in which a Nash equilibrium does not exist. Consider this game, we have five jobs. These are their lenses, A, B, C, D, E. We have three machines to be denoted M1, M2, and M3. Machine one is the first machine. It has speed one, and this is the priority list of the first machine. And we have two slow machines. They have a rate speed one half, and they share the same priority list. So the two slow machines are identical. They have the same speed and the same priority list. Now looking at this instance, uh, job A is the first job on the priority list of the first machine. So clearly this job in every Nash equilibrium, this job will be the first on the first machine. Because if it's not first on the first machine, it has a beneficial migration. If a Nash equilibrium exists, then job A is clearly located here. Otherwise, it can reduce its completion time. So we know for sure that if a Nash equilibrium exists, job A is placed here. Similarly, for job E, given that job A is here, we can say that job E is first on one of the two remaining uh, machines. Without loss of generality, let's assume that E is the first on the second machine, because E is the first on the priority list of the other machines, even if it is right after A on the first machine, it would migrate to one of these machines, so E is placed here. And I will show you that no Nash equilibrium exists by showing that job D has no valid assignment. Let's consider all the possible locations of job D. Assume first that job D is somewhere on M1. We don't know exactly where because we don't know how many additional jobs are there on M1, but assume first that job D is on M1. If job D is on M1, then job B would go to M3 because job B now knows that he has the possibility to be first on M3. So if job D is on M1, job B would go to M3. As a result, job C would go to M1 because considering the fact that B is already assigned and we know the other assignment, job C, the best thing job C can expect is to go to M1. Now job D knows that its completion time is 18.75 and it has a beneficial migration to M3 meaning that there is no Nash equilibrium in which job D is on M1. Similarly, we can show that there is no Nash in which job D is on M2. If job D is on M2, then clearly it has a beneficial migration to M3. And similarly, we can show that there is no Nash equilibrium in which job D is on M3. If job D goes to M3, then job B would better go to M1. If job B go to M1, then job C would go to M2. Of course, we need to, dis to, to see the, the numbers in order to be convinced with each of these uh, outcomes, but they are valid. Given that B and C are assigned in this way, job D would go to M1 because it would reduce its completion time. Job, remember that machine three is slow and machine one is fast. So being third on M1 is better for job D compared to being alone on M3. So again, there is no Nash equilibrium in which D is on M3. We can conclude and say that there are games in which a Nash equilibrium does not exist. And this is a problem. Uh, if a Nash equilibrium is not guaranteed to exist, then of course, best response dynamics is not guaranteed to converge. 
and we cannot analyze all the nice things, uh, all the equilibrium inefficiency. Moreover, not only that the Nash equilibrium may not exist, we don't have a way to characterize, give me a game. And if you ask me, does the Nash equilibrium exist? I can't tell you. It's NP complete to decide whether a game has a Nash equilibrium. So given an instance of the game, I can't find it. It's not guaranteed that I would be able to find an Nash equilibrium, and I don't have an efficient way to decide whether an Nash equilibrium exists. Uh, so given that this is the situation, and there is a, the, 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 this proof is deduction from three-bounded three-dimensional matching. Given that this is the situation, uh, we worked on specific class of the game. So we identified classes of games for which we can come up with positive results. So the four classes are games with unit jobs, games on two machines, games on identical machines, and the case that we have arbitrary machines, but a global priority list. So all the machines have the same priority list. For each of these four classes, we were able to come up with positive results. And looking at this condition, you can now know that the characterization is tight. So we cannot extend it, for example, to three machines because our no Nash example is with three machines. We cannot uh, extend it to here instead of considering global priority lists. There are only two different priority lists. No, in this example, we have exactly two priority lists. So the no Nash example that we just saw is tight. Is, it is tight in a sense that there are three machines, two of them are identical, they have the same speed and same priority list. So we cannot expect to have better good news uh, uh, given this example. For each of the four classes, uh, we present a polynomial time algorithm for computing a Nash equilibrium. So not only that a Nash equilibrium exists, it can be computed efficiently. Uh, we prove that best response dynamics converges to a Nash equilibrium, and we analyze the equilibrium inefficiency. Uh, uh, these are the results of the equilibrium inefficiency. Uh, we are not going to go all over them. Next thing, we are going to delve into the details of the analysis of two machines. So this is the plan for now to analyze the case of two machines. But in general, you can see that for all the classes, the price of anarchy and the price of stability are the same. So there are games in which the worst Nash equilibrium and the best Nash equilibrium, they are the only Nash equilibrium that exists in a game. We don't have a different column for the price of anarchy and the price of stability. Okay, so let's discuss two machines. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so two machines. Uh, first, the good news that the Nash equilibrium exists. If M equals two, then the Nash equilibrium exists and can be calculated efficiently. And the proof is simply by an algorithm. And this is the algorithm. The algorithm first assign all the jobs on the first machine according to the priority list of the first machine. Here we don't have too much choice. Okay, if all the jobs go to the first machine, they are assigned according to the priority list of the first machine. And then we consider the jobs one after the other according to their order in the priority list of the second machine and let them perform best response move. For example, if the priority list of the second machine starts with J3 and then J1, then we ask J3, ask him here, do you want to migrate to M2? Let's say that yes, it would like to move to M2. M2, this is the slower machine. So J3 would be extended a bit, but it's still worth migrating because now it's going to be first. And so on, we consider the jobs according to their order on the second machine and let each of them perform a best response move. That's the whole algorithm, just one path over the jobs, after one such iteration, we claim that the result is a Nash equilibrium. Let's prove it. So we prove it by considering the jobs that are, let's sigma, denote the final schedule, the schedule produced by the algorithm. 
First, it's relatively easy to see that the jobs on M1 have no incentive to deviate. The jobs on M1, they already got an opportunity to deviate during the algorithm. Since the time they were suggested to migrate, jobs only moved out, uh, job, jobs were only added to M2. So clearly now they don't have an incentive to deviate to M2 now that it has only more jobs. So jobs on the first machine are stable. Let's assume by contradiction that some job J on the second machine now has an incentive to deviate. This is the current location of the job on the second machine and it would like to return to the first machine. How come that it would like to return? What caused him to return? The fact that some job that were before J when it was suggested to move, uh, uh, when it was the turn of J in the algorithm, there were some jobs, let's call this group Delta, there were some jobs on the first machine that moved to the second machine. Now they are on the second machine. So this area of jaws that are before J on the first machine is now smaller. And now J may like to return to uh, the first machine because more jobs were suggested to leave the first machine and indeed they did that. So more formally, let Delta be the set of jobs that have a higher priority on M1 than J, than J, and they moved to M2 after J. They were before him, before him it migrates, and now they are after it. What's the formal uh, situation? We know that migrating back to M1 is beneficial for J. So PA plus PJ, is the current completion, the, the completion time of J, if it would return to the first machine, it would be placed here. This completion time is better than its current completion time, which is PB plus PJ divided by S2. Migrating back to M1 is beneficial for J. We also know that for the last job in Delta, it was beneficial when it was offered to move to M2, he really moved to M2. It knows that its completion time on M2, this delta is located somewhere here, and it moved to M2, meaning that PB plus PJ plus P delta divided by S2, the completion time of this job on M2 is at least this value. It was beneficial for this job to migrate, so this value is less than PA plus P delta. That was its completion time before the migration. Manipulating these two equations, we get that PJ plus P delta divided by S2 is less than P delta. And this is a contradiction to the fact that PJ is no negative and S2 is the slow machine. So we conclude that the algorithm provides a Nash equilibrium. Let me only mention that if we have unrelated machines, then already for two machines, it might be the case that no, no Nash equilibrium exists. So for unrelated machines, where PIJ is the processing time of job J on machine I, then a Nash equilibrium may not exist already with only two machines. For two identical, not identical, but two different speeds machine for two related machines, these are our good news. So this is the existence proof for two machines. We also analyze the equilibrium inefficiency. I will skip the proof. I will only mention that for two machines, we prove that the price of anarchy, the price of anarchy, which is the longest, the worst make spend, we may end up with in a Nash equilibrium uh, compared to the social optimum, the price of anarchy is at most, if the two machines have speed S1, which is one, and S2, which is less than one, then the price of anarchy is at most the minimum between one plus S2 and one plus one over one plus S2. And nothing too special in the analysis. So we proved separately the fact that the price of anarchy is between one plus S2 and the price of anarchy is less than one plus uh, one plus one plus one over one plus S2. And these two terms, uh, they are the 
same when S is the golden ratio implying that square root of five plus one divided by two. So I'll see the proof. And we have a matching analysis for the price of stability. The price of anarchy shows that the worst Nash equilibrium is at most something. And in this theorem, we showed that there exists a game in which even the best Nash equilibrium achieves uh, this ratio. And this proof is just by example. Give me an S, I will describe a game for which the only Nash equilibrium is that bad. The maximum of the best Nash equilibrium divided by the minimum maximum is this ratio. And naturally, we had to distinguish between uh, uh, the case that the second machine, the slow machine, has rate which is less than square root minus five divided by two, meaning that the minimum is achieved by one plus s. And the second case, again, I'm not going to go into the details, but the second case is when the second machine is faster relatively, and then we need a different machine. In both cases, the price of stability achieves the match the price of anarchy. For identical machines, we have one non-surprising result. The non-surprising result is that we may end up with the schedule, the, the machines are identical in, in a sense that they all have the same speeds, okay? They all have the same speeds, but not the same priority list. Every machine has its own priority list, but they all have the same speed. And Nash equilibrium exists, and this is the price of anarchy. And the proof is by showing that every Nash equilibrium can be an outcome of list scheduling algorithm. And for list scheduling, we know that this is the approximation ratio. So now instead of talking about approximation ratio, we can refer to it as the price of anarchy. We may end up with a Nash equilibrium whose max span is that bad compared to the optimum. So this is not a big deal. The more challenging result is that there are game in which we can do better than this in polynomial time, or let's read it formally, if all the machines have the same speed, but possibly different, uh, possibly different uh, priority list, then it is NP how to approximate the best Nash equilibrium within a factor of two minus one over A minus epsilon for all epsilons. So possibly there exists a great Nash equilibrium, there are many good Nash equilibrium, but still we cannot come up, we cannot calculate a good one up to that factor in polynomial time. This I think, I think this is a nice result because it distinguishes between a traditional approximation and what we can do within the range of stable solutions. Okay, so that was the end of the first part. And now let's leave the game and let's return to the centralized setting. In the centralized setting, there is a centralized authority that determines the outcome. Uh, for this setting, again, we, we do have priority list, but it's not a game. The outcome is determined by the algorithm. We have a set of N jobs. We have a set M of M parallel machines. Every job has processing time. Here we also considered unrelated machines. So in unrelated machines, PIJ is the processing time of job J on machine I. And every machine has its own priority list defining its scheduling policy like in the game. And let's concentrate for now on the problem of minimizing the total flow time, sub J, CJ, the total completion time. Um, let me only mention that in the centralized setting, we don't, we didn't study at all the priority list when the problem was minimizing the make span. Okay, when we analyze the make span, uh, the presence of priority list does not change the problem because when we only care about the make span, we don't care about the internal order of the jobs on the machines. So if the job, if it's not a game and 
the jobs themselves don't care about their internal order, then minimizing the max span is the traditional problem of minimizing the max span with or without priority list, it doesn't matter because we don't care about the internal order. This is why we, it's not that we chose to analyze the total flow, and this is the only interesting uh, problem here. So without priority list, the picture is well known. So just minimizing the total completion time, this is solvable by SPT. And if we have unrelated machine, there is a very nice reduction to the problem of finding a mean weight uh, matching in a bipartite, where for every age, we, we know the weight of the edge correspond to assigning the job on a specific, on a specific slot on the machines. So without priority lists, uh, both problems are simple. Uh, what did we show? That unfortunately, with priority list, the problem is hard. Not only that it's hard, it's also hard to approximate. APX hard is stronger, it's, it's, it's worse than anti-hardness. It means that we cannot come up with a PITAS, for example, okay? That it's hard and hard to approximate. There exists a constant and we cannot come up with a, with a one minus C, a constant one minus C approximation. And again, given in light of this bad news, our result mostly consider uh, restricted classes of the problem. Uh, what happens when we have a global priority list? What happens when we have a fixed number of machines or other uh, restriction? Uh, we can summarize our result in a, this table. I'm not going, as before, I'm not going to go into all the details. Uh, I will only mention these two last uh, uh, groups. So what is pi IC and pi global C? Uh, we assume that the priority list is not a complete order of all end jobs. The jobs are partitioned into a constant number C of job classes. And all the jobs from the first class must be before the jobs of the second class. And within every class, machine I processes the jobs in SPT order. This is the optimal thing for the machine to do. If C is a constant, then the problem may be easier as we show when we have just a global priority list that all the machines share and only a constant number of classes, then the problem is polynomially solvable. All other cases are either APXR or we can come up with a quasi pitas Quasi means that it's it's n to the polylog of n, not, not n to just one over epsilon, but n appear in the exponent, but in logarithmic. Um, if we have a constant number of machines, then some of these bad news becomes good news. Then we can come up with the polynomial time algorithm. Again, I'm not going to, die to, to show you all the results. Of course, let's only concentrate on machines on, on this kind, on LPT, when the priority list is LPT. Here is a useful observation, a useful observation in general, not just for any, for any uh, 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 priority list, for any structure of priority list. And this is not surprising. This useful observation is a common tool in the analysis of total flow time. Um, if we know that the number of jobs on machine I is Li, then we know how much each of the jobs on the machine will delay the other job. So the job with the case highest priority assigned to machine I contributes exactly Li plus one minus K times its processing time to the sum of completion time. For example, if do, job, this job J is the third from last, you see it's the third from last on the machine, then PIJ would be counted Li plus one minus Li minus two, which is three times in the total flow time, because this job delays itself, it, it delays the jobs after it, and it delays the last job. So in general, for every location, we know this is what we denote the delay coefficient of the job. And this is true for every analysis of total completion time with or without 
priority list. And it's true with identical machine or with unrelated machines because here we count PIJ, it's not just PI. So we have a different way to look at the sum JPJ. Sum JPJ is actually the sum of the delay coefficient times the processing time. And we use this property in the analysis and let's see how we use it in the analysis of pi LPT. Pi LPT means that all the machines process the jobs in LPT order. When we have identical machines, it's like having a global priority list. We have one global priority list uh, where the jobs in this priority list are sorted in a, a non-increasing order. When we have unrelated machines, it means that for every machine, uh, pi i is 1i, 2i, and i, where these indices are the order of the jobs when they are sorted according to LPT, referring to the processing time of the jobs on this specific machine. So these are the problems with pi LPT priority list. We have good news for identical machines and bad news for uh, unrelated machines. And the optimal algorithm for the identical machine is based on the following claim. And I, I will just describe it in a figure. The claim says something like that. Let's order the jobs from longer to shortest, from longest to shortest. There exists an optimal schedule in which we only need to cut this long chain of jobs and determine these numbers, L1, L2, LM, determine the number of jobs on each machine. And there exists an optimal schedule in which the L1 longest job go to one machine and the next batch of uh, L2 jobs go to the second machine and the last job gets the last batch of a dust machine gets the last batch of jobs. We cannot, we cannot have, for example, such a non-structured structured, uh, schedule where jobs are arbitrarily uh, uh, partitioned among the machine. There exists an optimal schedule in which we just cut the chain of the jobs in this way and assign the longest jobs one after the other, the next job one after the other, and this claim is a bit surprising and let's prove it and I'll prove it only for two machines because it can be extended by induction. So it's sufficient to prove for two machines. So assume that we know that there are L1 jobs on one machine and L2 jobs on the second machine. I claim that if L1 is at most L2, I will just put the L1 longest machine, longest jobs here and the L2 shortest jobs here. So we show that in some optimal schedule, M1 processes the L1 longest job and M2 processes the L2 shortest job. And we are going to use this observation regarding the delay coefficient. Consider the second machine. They are identical. Okay, it's not that one is fast and one is slow. M2 is the one that has more jobs. This one, M2 has L2 jobs. M1 has only L1 job. Consider the ice job on machine two. I claim that, first of all, this is, this is not a claim, this is from the observation that the delay coefficient of this job is L2 plus one minus I. I claim that the shortest possible job that can get this coefficient is job L1 plus I, okay, because there are not enough sufficient, there are not enough shorter jobs. This job must have at least L2 minus I jobs after it. So on the, the, the shortest possible job that can get this coefficient is job L1 plus I. I, can, I cannot put, for example, the shortest job here because if it's the shortest job, it is the last in the priority list. It cannot have jobs after it. The shortest job I can put here is some job that can that should have sufficiently that number of jobs after it, and this is job L2 plus 1 minus I. Now let's consider the first machine. 
Think about the longest job in the instance. The longest job in the instance, this is also the first job in the priority list because by LPT, the longest job is going to be first. If it's going to be first on the first machine, its delay coefficient would be L1. If it's going to be first on the second machine, its delay coefficient would be L2. The minimal coefficient that the longest job can get is therefore L1, because L1 is at most L2. And in general, for any job at most L1, the minimal coefficient job I can get is L1, L, L1 plus one minus I. So for example, in every schedule, the longest job has coefficient at least L1. And the nice thing about scheduling jobs in this scheme is that we achieve all the lower bound. When the jobs are scheduled following this structure, then all, every, for on M2, every coefficient on M2 is matched with the shortest job that can get this coefficient. And every job on M1 is matched with the minimal coefficient it can get. So we have the claim about this structured uh, optimal solution. Given this claim, we can now come up with a dynamic programming because now we only need to determine these numbers, L1, L2, and so on. There is still an exponential number of options, but there is a dynamic program that, uh, in, in which we show that we don't really need to consider all the exponential number of options, but uh, uh, only a polynomial number. So this is the optimal algorithm for identical machine. Last thing that I'm going to show is that with unrelated machine, the problem is hard and even how to approximate. So even if all the machines uh, apply the same local policy of LPT, the problem is hard and hard to approximate, to approximate. And this is in contrast to the general case. If you remember, I told you that R in general, uh, some some of flow time can be solved using the reduction to flow. When we have this constraint of pi LPT, the problems become APXR. And this is going to be true, the, the, the reduction that I'm going to show now, jobs only have two possible lenses, either one or zero. So here is the reduction. The reduction is going to be from vertex cover. I will only show uh, anti-hardness. At the end, I will mention why it's APX. Anti-hardness, it's going to be a reduction from vertex cover. So given the graph G and an integer K, the vertex cover problem is whether G has a vertex cover of size K, a vertex cover. So here, for example, we have a vertex cover of size two. We can select two uh, nodes such that every edge is adjacent to at least one red endpoint. Okay, this is the classic uh, uh, vertex cover problem, which is known to be anti-hard. So given an instance of a, a vertex cover, we should define a problem of scheduling on unrelated machine with a LPT priority list. In our instance, we are going to have V machines, the number of nodes, where machine I corresponds to node I, and we are going to have two sets of jobs, D and A. D, these are dummy jobs. There are going to be V minus K dummy jobs. And these dummy jobs, they have unit processing time independent of the machines, of the machine they are assigned to. So the setting R, let us define arbitrary uh, processing time, but for the dummy jobs, they have the same unit lengths on all the machines. The job uh, the set A includes E jobs, one job for each edge, and these are the processing time. So an edge originated job UV, the processing time of UV on machine I is zero. If I is an endpoint of the edge, if I equals U or I equals V, and of course, in, instead of zero, I could put here a small epsilon if someone is bothered by these zeros, and one otherwise. So the processing time is one if it's not an endpoint and zero if it's an endpoint. Here, for example, 
we are going to build an instance with five machines because there are five nodes, A, B, C, D, E. The set of jobs include three dummy jobs. Why three? Because we are asked whether there is a vertex cover of size two and five minus two is three. So we have three dummy jobs and the edge originated uh, jobs. And think about the fact that we apply PI LPT. Priority list based on LPT implies that if a job is assigned on a machine corresponding to one of its endpoints, then its processing time is zero. If its processing time is zero, then it is processed last. It is processed after any dummy job assigned on this machine. So now we can prove that there exists a vertex cover of size K if and only if there exists a schedule with total completion time V minus K. And back to the example, it will demonstrate this uh, statement. So let's say that we have a vertex cover of size two, A and C, this is a vertex cover of size two. So we will keep A and C uh, for all the edge uh, jobs because it's a vertex cover. Every edge has an endpoint, which is either A or C. I will place all the edge jobs on A and C. This will leave me exactly V minus K empty machines and each of the dummy job can go to a different empty machine. If there is no vertex cover of size two, then one job edge must be assigned on a non endpoint machine or after a dummy job, then the sum of completion time would be more than V minus K. So this completes the reduction. There is a vertex cover of size K if and only if we can partition the jobs among the machines such that all the edge originated jobs will have completion time C. And this hardness proof can be extended to show also hardness of approximation. This is a bit more technical. It appears in the paper. The reduction now is not, it's not, it's not just from vertex cover, but from the optimization problem of given a budget K for a vertex cover, cover as many edges as possible. This problem is known to be APX hard even for bounded degree graphs. And we need the bounded degree for the reduction. Again, some technical details that are in the paper. Summing up. So we introduced the problem of machine dependent priority list. So there are many traditional ways to, to have priorities among the job, like president's constraints that are uniform for all the machines and uh, uh, assigning weights to jobs. This is another way to give different priorities. Having machine dependent priorities, this is something that was not studied uh, earlier and it opens a new world of optimization problems. Uh, I hope I convinced you that the analysis of these settings is challenging both as an optimization problem and as a game. Uh, for, the, for general instances, uh, no guaranteed Nash equilibrium and some hard to approximation results. On the other hand, we were able to identify some classes that behave nicely. And of course, there is a long list of open problems. Uh, first of all, this is something that we are still wondering whether the problem is NP-hard. We were able to come up with a quasi-polynomial time approximation scheme, but we don't have a hardness proof. Uh, there are probably more tractable or stable instances that are waiting to be discovered and better approximation algorithm. One, I believe, nice generalization would be the following. So what is a priority list? A priority list, it can be viewed as, as the fact that on each machine, we have some precedence constraint given by a chain. This is the priority list of the machine, as if we have precedence constraint given by a chain. Usually when we study precedence constraint, the precedence constraint are shared for the whole instance. 
okay, we are given a scheduling uh, instance with a graph representing the presence constraint. It is, I believe it is interesting to study such problem when the president's constraints are specific per machine. Actually, all our work can be viewed as a very special case of this setting when the president's constraint per machine are given by a, ch by a chain. But the general problem of parallel machine with machines based president's constraint, as far as I know, it was not studied uh, before. Maybe you can tell me something else. Uh, another direction that we actually started already is to study instance with totally different objective. Uh, jobs may have due dates and latest re related objective. Again, every machine has its own priority list and all the classical problems of minimizing the tardiness and minimizing the total uh, tardiness or maybe even what's the, this is a problem that we are still working on it. So let's say that we even have a global priority list. What is the minimal number of machines required to complete all the jobs on time? Looks like a very simple problem. Looks as if we can easily come up with a two approximation algorithm. We are still uh, shooting in the air here. And uh, I think that's all. Thank you. Okay, tell me, thank you very much. Uh... So let me open discussion. I will let people ask about participants. So, so now everybody should be able to unmute. Yeah. So, so any questions? Uh, I think Brita Pay says a question apparently. Okay, Brita, please go ahead. Huh? She has to. Uh, um, hi, Tommy. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I really like that problem and discussed it some time ago with Mark and Vipin. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I forgot everything. So, um, uh, in, in the table where you had the hardness results and some, some of it were polynomial, you said. So, the centralized problem? problem? Like this one? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Where you said if it M is a constant, so for constant number of machines, you said it's. You have some polynomial time algorithm, but yes. let's say for three machines or so, is this is... Uh... Yes, it's based on dynamic programming. If we, have, if we have a constant number of machines, then we can slowly uh, build the schedule actually from the end towards the beginning by dynamic programming. Using this idea of analyzing the delay coefficient. Okay. But it's like something M to the four of four machines, or so. Uh, yeah. For if the constant is large, the number, the running time is pretty, pretty, pretty bad, right? Um, I I think it's uh, M to the three, M to the two, something like that. And 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 let me mention that we what, that even for LPT, we don't know what the situation with a constant number of machines. Even for two machines and LPT, we don't know whether we machines. We don't know what's the situation. The hardness proof I showed at the end is for an arbitrary number of machines, but it's open. For, for a constant number of machines, the, the complexity status is open. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other question? I have, uh, I have two questions. One of them, can you give me some, uh, the first one is a simple question. Can you give me some very nice examples in practice where you have the machine independent priority list? Yeah, yeah. I, I, we actually aware of a follow-up paper in which they discussed, uh, like you have a, a freelancer, let's say a graph, someone who designed graphics or something like that, and they are getting problem, each of them, has its own priorities. Some, let's say, some of them prefer to design logos for companies. Some of them design. So here is a setting okay. in which the machines have different priority lists because the machines have their own uh, uh, have their own advantages. Or yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That's that's a reasonably good one. Yeah. Then I suppose the next step, a next step for you would be. <laughs> Maybe I've already started thinking about that. Uh, 
about due date related objectives. So exactly. summation UJ and summation TJ. Of course, it becomes yeah. immediately very, very hard. But have you thought about summation UJ and summation TJ when all the processing times are equal? Yes. Because for then, this, yeah, for this, I think we have an optimal algorithm. Here, greedy would work. Some variation of a greedy algorithm would work. Uh -huh. Okay. You, that... you are right that you under, you you exactly identified the the only so far uh, tractable class for for even for... when the machines have different speeds. So the Fine. jobs have yeah okay okay I... yeah that is uh, that would be intuitive. So by the way, summation U J and also summation T J. Uh, I'm not sure about. Uh, uh, no, only for the maximal tardiness we have a nice result, but I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I need oh, okay. to, to look at it. Uh -huh. but, uh, okay, you give, you give me more motivation to, to check it again. Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's my only question. Okay. Any other question? Uh, hello. Uh, can you yeah. hear me? Yes. yes. If I may, I have one. Uh, I just got a little bit lost when we have the priority uh, lists uh, according to the LPT rule. Um, I just didn't understand uh, why we have all the longest tasks on one machine and then the shortest uh, tasks on the other. And it doesn't switch uh, like parallelly because right now it doesn't really hold for the LPT, right? Because the task L2, which is the first one on the M2 machine, uh, is a, actually one of the shorter ones, uh, and some of the longer tasks on machine M1 will finish after that. So I just uh, got a little bit uh, lost in the LPT rule. The, the, the idea is that the priority list only determines the internal order on each specific machine. Oh, I see, I see. So we can uh, like choose which, yeah, uh, which set will be where, and then the priority uh, yes. mm -hmm. list is applied. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other question? If not, so let me close uh, this session. Thank you very much for, for following us. Uh, okay. And uh, there will be uh, no talk in two weeks because uh, vacations are starting uh, soon. So we will meet in the mid of September probably. So I will send announcements at the beginning of September to let you know about uh, the talks uh, uh, in the, let's say, fourth fall series, okay? So thank you for being with us and uh, have, a nice, uh, have a nice holidays and uh, get many scheduling programs resolved, right? Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.